Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I want to break down a little bit more of the polynomials that we were looking at yesterday. You know, in yesterday's assignment or yesterday's video, we were talking about how you can solve equations for polynomials that are written in factored form, something like this, where we just asked ourselves, okay, the final answer is zero, and I know the zero product property tells me that in order to have a multiplying problem where the answer is zero, I know one of the two parentheses, if not both of the parentheses, has to equal zero. Because the only way you get zero as an answer to a multiplying question is to have one of the factors, right, one of the things that you're multiplying, equal zero. So like in this example, um, if x equal negative five in this parentheses, uh, we could have an answer of zero, because then it would be zero times whatever. And then over here, if x equal three, then the whole thing would equal zero because it would be three minus three, which is zero and zero times eight, because three plus five would be eight, zero times eight equals zero. So that's what we talked about yesterday. That's however, that's how you're gonna solve them whenever they're written in factored form. But what if they're not written in factored form? What if they're written like the examples I have on the board here in the black marker? What if they're in just regular standard form, or some of these aren't even in standard form because I don't have them from highest degree to lowest degree. But what if they aren't um, factored yet, right? What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to factor them ourselves. And the way you do that is you use the greatest common factor, the GCF. Now, I'm going to assume that a lot of my students have already done this in seventh grade, maybe possibly in sixth grade, but I'm not sure. So in case you are unfamiliar or you just need a refresher, whenever you need to factor something, you look at both terms individually and you ask yourself, okay, what do they have in common, right? What's the biggest number that goes into both of those? So out of the two coefficients we have, we have 15 and we have 20, what could I divide both those numbers by? All right, what's the biggest number, the greatest common factor that I could divide both those numbers by? And obviously a lot of people would say, okay, yeah, you could divide both those by five, right? So we're gonna factor out the five. Um, but what about the letter Ds, right? Don't they also have letter Ds in these as well? Each term has a certain amount of Ds, and so what we have to do is ask ourselves, okay, how many Ds do they have in common, right? And so the way sometimes I ask students, especially when they're first learning it, is do both terms have at least one letter D? And the answer is obviously yes. Do both of these terms have at least two letter Ds? And the answer is yes. And then you just keep going until you can't say yes anymore. Do both terms have at least three letter Ds in them? And the answer is no, right? This one only has two. So what we can say is both of these terms have at least two letter Ds in them, right? D squared is what they both have. They both have at least two Ds. Um, they don't have three because that first one only has two. So that's how you factor something. Uh, you take out the GCF, and then for your final answer, what you have to do is you have to do a parentheses, and inside the parentheses, you need to represent what's left over if you divided everything by five and you took two Ds away from everything, right? So let's look over here. If I did the number 15 and I divided it by five, what would be left? Uh, 15 divided by five is three. And if I took the two Ds and I yanked them out and I stole them away from here, how many Ds would I have left? Uh, I wouldn't have any Ds left. So I just have a three would be left, right? Uh, and so then we're gonna put the plus sign and then to finish off my answer, I'll look here in the red part that I have uh, kind of in brackets. I had 20 and I've decided to divide it by five. 20 divided by five would leave me with four. And this one had five letter Ds to start. If I took away two and yanked them out of the parentheses, how many letter Ds are gonna be left? If I started with five and I took away two, well, five minus two is three, so I would have three Ds left over, right? And what this is is called factoring. And honestly, it is the complete opposite, or it's the inverse of the distributive property, right? If I was doing this for the first time and I wanted to check my answer to make sure I was right, could I distribute this, do 5D squared times three? And could I distribute this, 5D squared times 4D to the third? And if you distribute it, you should end up with your original problem, right? This is the same as this. And that's a way to check your answer if you're good at distributing, a way to tell, hey, did I factor this correctly, right? If you distribute it back out, could I get the original statement, the original question? And so that is the whole idea behind factoring. And now it's written kind of like the questions that we were looking at yesterday, right? So let's go ahead and knock out these other ones fairly quickly. 
Uh, feel free to pause the video or rewind it if I go a little bit too quickly or it doesn't quite make sense. In this example, I'm looking at the coefficients. Um, as far as the numbers go, both of these go into 3, right? I can do 21 divided by 3. I can do 3 divided by 3. One kind of tricky thing about this that I haven't mentioned yet, if you ever have a negative as your leading coefficient, it starts with a negative, you always have to divide by a negative number. So instead of just dividing by 3, we're going to divide by negative 3. We're going to factor out a negative 3. And then I look at the letter Ds again. How many letter Ds do they have in common? Do they both have at least one letter D? Yes. Do both terms have at least two letter Ds here and here? Yes. Do both of them have at least three? Yes. Do they both have at least four letter Ds? They do not. This one has seven, but this one doesn't go above three. So the most amount of Ds that we can kind of steal away from here and yank out of the parentheses is three. Now, what would be left over if we did that, right? If we had uh, this term and if we had negative three D to the third to start, if we divided by negative three, okay, negative three divided by negative three is one, um, if I had three Ds to start and I yanked them all out here and I took them out of the parentheses, I don't have any Ds left. And so uh, I just have a 1, and that's kind of weird, but that happens sometimes. In the second parentheses, I started with 21. I'm dividing it by negative 3. So you know what? I don't need a plus sign there. 21 divided by negative 3 is negative 7. I guess I could have kept it as plus negative 7, but I don't really prefer to do it that way. And then here I had seven Ds to start, and I've taken away three. I've taken three and yanked them out of the parentheses. So if I had seven and I've yanked three away, how many are left? Seven minus three would leave me with four. Okay, um, okay the next one is probably the easiest example. You've got two different terms here. I didn't put a variable on the second one. What do those have in common? Uh, both the numbers can be divided by two. And do they have any X's in common? Hmm... I don't think so, right? This one doesn't have any X's on it at all. So I can't do anything with X's like I did up here with the letter D. So 2 is the only thing that they have in common. Now I'm just going to divide everything by 2. Over here, 2 divided by 2 would just leave me with 1X, which you don't have to put the 1. You could just put an X. And here, 14 divided by 2 would be 7. And that's all for the third one. Okay, let's finish it off with one more. I tried to go a little bit trickier on this one and put three different terms. This is obviously a trinomial. Don't let that bother you. It's still able to be solved just like the way we've been doing the others, right? If they give you a trinomial, just look at all three of them. What do all three terms have in common? As far as the numbers go, or the coefficients, we've got a 4, we've got a 12, we've got an 8. Um, could I divide all those by 2? Yeah. But is there a number bigger than 2 that I could divide them all by? Mm, I think there is, right? Could I divide them all by 4? I think I could. So if I divide them all by 4, that's going to be the number part of my GCF. Now, what about the X's? Do they all have X's in them? Yes, yes, yes. How many X's could I take away from all three? Do, the, do I have at least one X in all of them? Of course. Do I have at least two X's in all of these? Yes. Do I have at least three X's in all three of those? I do. Do I have at least four X's in all of them? Here I do. Here I do. Ooh, I don't have four X's in this one. So four is not going to be enough. I can only say with confidence that I can take three X's out of each term, right? So I'm going to divide each coefficient by 4, and I'm going to take three x's away from each x term, and we'll see what's left. So here I'm going to do 4 divided by 4. That's obviously 1. I'm going to take three x's away from what I started with. This one started with 5, so if I take away 3, that leaves me with 2. Um, here, 12 is what I started with. I'm going to divide it by 4. 12 divided by 4 is 3. I had four X's to start. I've already yanked three of them out here, so there's only going to be one left inside the parentheses because I've taken three away. And then here, eight divided by four is going to leave me with two. And I had three X's to start, and I've yanked them all out. I've decided to take away three X's, and I only had three, so I don't have any X's left. So there would be your official answer for that last one. Okay, that is how you factor using the GCF. I'm assuming and hoping that my kids have done that before, but I don't know, because I know there's some things they never got to in 7th grade math. So, what's the whole point of this, right? There wasn't an equal sign in any of these questions. The only place you see an equal sign is where I wrote it to show my answer. So, how does this really help us with what we did yesterday? Well, that's where the next board comes into play. Here's what these questions are eventually going to look like, right? They're eventually going to turn into equations. You can see this is exactly like what we just looked add on the last board. The only difference is now it says equals zero at the end, and that kind of looks familiar with yesterday's video, right? 
So what we're going to attempt to do is to take this statement that is not in factored form. We're going to try to factor it, right? Step one. We're going to factor it using all the skills we just went over. And then uh, we're going to use the GCF to factor it. And then step two, we're going to have to do the zero product property that we did yesterday in order to get the two different answers, or sometimes it was just one answer that showed up twice. But I'm guessing on these, we'll probably have two different answers, right? So here is our strategy. Let me get property on there. It didn't quite fit. There we go. So we need to factor this first. I can't solve this quite like I did yesterday yet because it's not factored. So I'm going to look at my two terms right here on the left-hand side. I've got this one and I've got this one. What do they have in common? Well, look at the coefficients. I could divide both those numbers. Um, both those numbers uh, could be divided by 5, right? So I'm going to um, put a 5 right here. How many x's do they have in common? Do they both have 1x? Yes. Do they both have 2x's in them? Yes. Do they both have at least 3x's? Yes. Do they both have at least 4x's? Ooh, no, they don't. This one does not have 4. So 3 is the highest. I can take 3x's away. And let's see what's left. If I divide both numbers by 5, and if I take 3x's away, what do I have left over? Right? Here, 10 divided by 5 would leave me with 2. And then if I took 3x's away and I had 4 to start, that's going to leave me with just one letter x. Uh, you can put a 1 there if you want. You really don't have to. And then 15 divided by 5 is 3. And if I have 3x's to start and I take away 3x's here, I don't have any x's left. Now, doesn't this look like the questions that we talked about yesterday, right? We have two things being multiplied. Sometimes they're both in parentheses, so you can put this in parentheses if you want. I have two statements being multiplied, and the final answer is 0. The only way to get the answer of 0 here is if one of these two parentheses equaled 0. So, what I can ask myself is, what number would I have to put right here in for the x to make it equal 0? And that obviously would be 0, right? Because 5 times 0 would give me 0. Um, let me go ahead and erase this off to the side. So I'm going to take each one of these statements and say, okay, what number would I put right here to make this equal 0? And the answer is 0. Or on the other statement, the other parentheses was this, 2x plus 3. What number would I have to put in the spot right here for the letter x to make it equal 0? And this is where you have a, a simple two-step equation. Uh, I'm going to do minus 3 on both sides. I'm going to get 2 times something equals negative 3. And then instead of multiplying by 2, I'm going to divide by 2. And my final answer is negative 3 over 2, which is the same thing as negative 1 and a half or negative 1.5. And so these have two answers. If x equaled 0, way back here, this whole statement would equal 0. Or if x equaled negative 1.5, we would get an answer of 0. Okay. So this is like a combination of what we did yesterday with what we just learned today. This is about as difficult um, as it can get, at least in this chapter. This is probably one of the hardest things we've done. All right, let's do another one just to make sure we're, we feel like we can get some confidence with this. Okay, step one. We want to look at the GCF. We need to factor this because it's not factored yet. What do these have in common? Um, when I see 7 and I see 28, I feel like I can divide both those numbers by 7. And then when I look at the x's, how many x's do they have in common? They both have 1x, they both have 2x's, both of these have 3, both of these have 4. These do both not have 5x's. 4 is the highest number I can say that they both have. Both terms have 4x's. Alright, so if I divide everything by 7 and I take away 4x's, what would be left? Here, 7 divided by 7 would be 1. If I take away 4x's and I started with 5, that means there's only 1x left. You could put x to the first if you wanted, but you don't have to. Here, the minus sign is going to stay. 28 divided by 7 is going to be 4. And I had 4x's to start, and I've yanked them all out outside the parentheses, so I don't have any x's left. And now this question looks like yesterday, right? You can put a parentheses around here if you want. If that helps you, you don't have to. And so this is a multiplying question, because this times this is multiplying. The final answer is 0. I know the only way to get a final answer of 0 in a multiplying question is to have one of the statements, either this statement or this statement, the other parentheses, equal 0. And so just solve each one of those, right? Here, 7 times something would equal 0. Um, 
I mean, you could divide by 7 on both sides if you wanted, but 0 divided by 7 equals 0. So what number to the fourth power equals 0? Uh, that's obviously 0. That first one usually equals 0. It doesn't always, but it, most of the time it does. And then over here, um, instead of minus 4, I would do plus 4 on both sides. That's going to give me 4. 1 times something equals 4. And that's obviously 4. 1 times 4 equals 4. So we have two answers on this one. x equals 0 or x equals 4. Okay, hopefully we're starting to get the hang of that. Oops, dropped my marker lid there. Let's do one last one on this board, and then we'll try uh, one more style, and then that should be it for this video, because I'm almost getting to 15 minutes. Uh, on this last one, the two terms, here and here, I'm looking at those, I could say, all right, those both can be divided by 3. How many y's do they have in common? They both have at least one y. They both have at least two y's. I do not have three y's in both. The highest number of y's I have is 2, so I'm going to divide everything by 3 and I'm going to take two y's away, and let's see what's gonna be left. Um, if I do three divided by three, that leaves me with one. If I take away two y's, I don't have any y's left, right? Basically, this is the same thing as the GCF, so when that happens, you still have to have a one there, because something divided by itself equals one. You just can't leave it empty. And then here, 18 divided by three is six, and then if I started with three y's and I've yanked away two, that leaves me with one. And so now we have the questions that we looked at yesterday, right? We have two factors being multiplied together. This can get its own parentheses if you want to. Uh, put parentheses around it. And how do I get a final answer of zero in a multiplying question? Well, that means one of the terms, either this, the first parentheses had to equal zero, or the second parentheses had to equal zero, or they both could have equaled zero, but in this case, it'll be one or the other. And then you just solve each one. All right. If you really want to go through the steps of solving this one, you could say, okay, I'm going to divide by 3. So what number squared equals 0? What number times itself equals 0? That's obviously 0. That first answer, like I said in the last question, is 0 quite often. Not always, but a lot of the time. And over here, you can't see the whole question. Let me move my board. Um, I would want to do minus 1 on both sides. That's going to give me 6 times something equals negative 1. And if I want to get the y... Isolated, instead of multiplying by 6, I'm going to divide by 6, and you would get y equals negative 1 sixth, which I'm just going to leave it like a fraction. You could write it like a decimal if you wanted to. Okay, Those are pretty complicated, right? It combines yesterday's skills with today's skills. Now, that is the quote-unquote normal version of the question. What happens when they decide to be the most rude individual they can, right? Someone who's writing these questions decides they want to try to ruin your day by giving you something like this. And you're going to look at this and be like, what in the world is going on here, right? Excuse me? What happened to the equal zero thing? This whole thing, uh, the, the all of yesterday's lesson was all about how do we solve it when equals zero. Uh, excuse me? What? I don't understand. This doesn't equal zero. How am I supposed to do this? I have one thing on one side and one term on the other side. Whoa, they're just trying to trick you here. Don't let it bother you. Remember... We can only solve these when it equals zero. If it doesn't equal zero, we are going to be really, really stuck here. So you have to go through one extra step at the beginning, and if you can get through this one extra step, it's going to be exactly like what we did on all the other questions on the previous board. Right? What we have to do first is we have to take what's ever over here on the right-hand side and move it over to the left-hand side by doing inverse operations. Right? We want it to equal zero. We don't want it to equal all of this stuff. I can't solve it when it equals all of this stuff. And so what you've got to do on this first one, instead of minus 12x squared, you're going to put plus 12x squared. Now, hold your horses. There is no way you can add those. Don't you dare try to add that and tell me it equals 18x to the fifth, anything like that. No way, Jose. You cannot add those. I know they both have x's, but one is x to the second and one is x to the third. So you have to keep them separated, just like that. Right? Same thing over here. Instead of 10y to the third, you're going to have to do minus or negative 10y to the third. You cannot subtract those because one is to the third power, one is to the second power. You see how this takes one extra step to rewrite it? And then once you rewrite it, it looks exactly like what we did on the last board. This one, instead of negative 80 to the w to the fifth, you're going to have to do plus 80w to the fifth. You cannot add these because one is w to the fifth and one is w to the sixth. If they were both w to the fifth or if they were both w to the sixth, then you could add them, but that's probably not going to happen very often. 
right? So this took one extra step. We had to take whatever was on the right-hand side, or I guess you could have taken whatever was on the left-hand side. Whatever's on one side of the equal sign, you need to move it to the other side. That way you can have all of the terms on the same side of the equal sign, and that way the other side is gonna equal zero. And just for consistency, I always like to put my terms on the left and have my equals zero on the right, but it would work the other way if you wanted to do it the other way. All right, I'm gonna go pretty quickly because I'm already at 20 minutes. How could I solve these? I do exactly what I did on the last board. Find the GCF. What do I have in common here? They can both go into six. And how many X's do they have in common? They both have at least two X's. So if I divide both of these terms by six and I move my board over so you can see the rest of the question. If I divide them both by six and I take away two X's, what would be left? I would have X to the first. And here I would have 12 divided by six is two and I would take both x's away, so I wouldn't have any. And then I could solve this just like I did yesterday. What number would I put in here to make this parentheses equal zero? Um, that would have to be zero. What number would go right here? That would have to be negative two, right? And I didn't show the work quite as well as I did on the last board, but hopefully you know what I'm talking about. On this parentheses, here and here, those both go into five. So I can divide both these by five. They both have at least two letter Y's. And so if I divide everything by five and I take two Y's away, what do I have left? Let's see, five divided by five is one. If I took two Y's away, that's how many I had to start. So I don't have any Y's left. Right here, the minus sign is still there. 10 divided by five is two. I had three Y's to start and I've taken away two. So that means I only have one Y left. And now we can do this like we did the last one. What number is going to make this parentheses equal zero? That's going to be zero. This one's going to be a little bit harder. And so if I needed to actually work it out right here, I can't maybe do that one in my head. I'm going to have to say, okay, what's happening to the y? I'm going to have to do minus one uh, to, because one minus one equals zero. Get that out of the way. And then here I'm going to have to divide by negative two. And this one's getting a little bit more lengthy. But you have negative 1 divided by negative 2, negative by, divided by negative is a positive. So this one has two answers. They're kind of separated. We had positive 1 half and 0. And then grand finale. Here and here, it looks like they both would go into a lot of numbers. I could divide them by 5. I could divide them by 4. I could divide them by 10. I could divide them by 20. 20 is the biggest. You have to do the greatest common factor. I can divide both those by 20. They both have at least 5 W's. So I take away 5 W's. What would be left? If I divide it here by 20, 20 divided by 20 is 1. If I took away 5 W's and I started with 6, there's only 1 W left. That's a W. Sorry about that. And then here, 80 divided by 20 is 4. And I had 5 W's to start, and I've yanked them all away. And so I don't have any W's left. And so now I'm just going to ask myself, in these two parentheses, what number would I substitute in here for the W to make this one equal 0? This would have to be 0, because 0 to the fifth power would be 0, and then 0 times 20 would obviously equal 0. That first one usually equals zero. And then for the second one, uh, what number would go right here to make it equal zero? Um, that would have to be negative four, right? Because negative four plus positive four would equal zero. So there you have it. Uh, that is a very lengthy video on how you can use factoring, use the GCF to solve a polynomial equation. Um, and we still use the zero product property, just like we talked about yesterday. You can see how this lesson was very lengthy. I don't know how they expected us to do all of this in one lesson in the book. I'm glad I split it up into two days. I'm going to give my algebra kids a chance to practice some of these on the Big Ideas Math website. If you struggle with them, don't feel bad. Don't feel stressed. Go back, watch the video, um, pause it. You can email me, and I'll be more than happy to help anyone who needs assistance on this. So thank you so much, and have a good rest of your day.